Well, good afternoon. My name is John Miller. I'm the executive director here for the Shippensburg Historical Society. And today we're going to take a look at behind the scenes with building interpretive programs and dealing with public history. Some of the things we want to talk about is the definition and principles of interpretation, how to make meaningful uh, programs that are enjoyable. We're going to work on communication as well as the presentation skills um, of the program, as well as some other things. So what is public history? It's a broad range of activities undertaken by people with some training in the discipline of history who are generally working outside of specialized academic settings. So if you work at a historical society or you volunteer there or you're working at a museum or a historical site, if you're talking about history with the public, that is public history. With public history comes interpretation. And what is that? Well, it's a mission-based communication process that forges emotional and intellectual connections between the interests of the audience and inherent meanings in the resource. So you as an interpreter, you're taking your group, which represents the present, and you're building a path or a bridge to their past in order for them to forge their way to the future. How do you build programs? Well, it's a complex system, um, the first of which is what the National Park Service uses. They have it broken down into seven steps. And those steps are, like step one is to select a tangible place, object, or a person that you think your audience is going to care about. Number two, you need to identify intangible means. These are the things that people can't grasp or see or touch because there's no physical presence. Step three, you need to build or identify a universal concept. That's your ideal. Step four, identify your audience. You know, you need to break it down between children, adults, and seniors. And one program may work well for one group of people, but will not work well for others. Number five, your theme statement. This is what the theme or the subject is going to be about. Six is your technique. You want to use interpretive techniques to link the tangible to the intangible meanings, providing audiences with opportunities to make personal connections to those meanings. That's your toolbox, basically. And then seven is your development. Basically, you're laying out an, an outline or your sub themes. When you break it down, like I did when I worked in the National or the Maryland Park Service, Basically, I would have a theme, sub-themes, and then a conclusion, which went right back into what the theme was about to begin with. Remember one thing, though. People often don't remember facts, but they will remember the themes. So putting a program together, first you find out what it is that you want to do, what kind of program you want, what is your subject. Look for primary sources. If there's enough primary sources, then I'm going to go ahead and start researching your presentation out. Begin building your sub-themes. That's pretty much the meat of the content that goes into the program. Try to keep it under one hour and be careful of secondary sources of interpretations with biased theories. When you look at your research triangle, you want documentation. If you can, try to find photographic evidence, and then try to find living examples to back up your theme. The content, people want to go to a park or a historical site. They're not there to visit, they're there to experience it. So when you're building a program, keep that in mind. Don't overload your program with long, drawn out quotes. Make sure you use good descriptions and emotions because that will help to set the background of your presentation. Think of thunderstorms and what that represents with lightning and thunder, the sound of running water. Think of that thunderstorm taking place at night and you're in the middle of a forest and how you have to rely on your senses rather than your sight. Human emotion and human senses is also important. 
So if you want to make use happy or sad, or if you want to use your senses with sight, hearing, or touch, or smell, those are always excellent to put into a presentation. Types of programs, you can have tours, living history, demonstrations, programs with PowerPoints or campfire talks, education, and you can't forget about naturalist programs themselves. When the program is finished, practice it. After you practice it, grab a peer or some of your friends, go through the tour with them, get their feedback, make adjustments. From there, and your program has been um, approved, go ahead and set the date, advertise, and prepare. Those are very important steps too. And after the program, make sure you record your numbers. We have it broken down here to a similar system that I used at Monterey Pass. That way I can see how many adults versus how many children and what types of programs that we have. Then comes the delivery. You want to be confident, make eye contact. Know your body posture, you don't want to sulk down. Watch your hand gestures, speak clearly. Make sure that everyone can hear you and watch the transitions, especially if you're on tours. Keep in mind if your eye, your hand, as well as your nonverbal communication, people can pick up on things based upon those three. Sunglasses are discouraged when you're given tours because of the fact that people can't see your eyes. So basically, when you're given a program, you want to be the do and not the don't. Avoid bad habits like um, like, or you know, and try not to sound like Shaggy from Scooby-Doo when you're given a program. Like, you know, like when the Confederate cavalry charged like through the town, um, they like, you know, you don't want that. Remember, you're representing the organization and you want to make sure that you're as professional as possible. Remember the basics, introduce yourself at the beginning of the tour, what organization you're with, what your title is, start it on time, make sure that your central theme was there and it was supported throughout the entire program. Make sure that the content related directly to the resource Watch your, mechanic, uh, your mechanics, make sure you're enthusiastic, you have good eye contact, good volume. Historical accuracy, you want to make sure that everything that's in that program is as accurate as possible. And make sure you're available to respond to comments as well as questions. Going into program ideals, obviously tours. Tours are a great way for people to experience your site. And it's a journey for business, pleasure, or education that often involves a series of stops. So those are good ways to get people to experience your site as well as allow them to see the tangible items that are there. Descriptions of the landscape, for example. Um, great part of tours is that if you have interpretive panels along the route, use those panels as your sub-themes. Tours are great at promoting the historical resources of the site. It's where people can kind of walk, experience. Um, it helps to connect the group if you have photographs and maps handy. So if you're talking about here in Shippensburg, General, General Albert Jenkins of the Confederate Army, have a picture of him. And always have a backup place in case of foul weather, such as thunderstorms or severe heat. Rules to tours. Be sure to arrive early, mingle with visitors, start on time, introduce yourself, your name, you know, your title, everything. Let the group know how long the tour is, where it's going to start, as well as where it's going to end. If there's anything strenuous about it, so if you see a lady with a baby stroller and you're going for a hike on the Appalachian Trail, probably not a good idea for her to bring that stroller with her. Never had to let the group outpace you, always be in the lead, be aware of your surroundings, keep moving, but then if you notice the tour is starting to lag, give time for the rear to catch up, and make sure that you end your tour on time and definitely allow questions. 
but hang out for a little while because somebody may not be comfortable with asking questions in the public. So they may wait until they can talk to you one on one. So make sure you're available. My rule of thumb was I always wait until the last person left. Aside from tours, different presentations of talks are excellent. Um, talks are a great way for people to get excited about your site, whether it's through a campfire program, which we do a lot of, or PowerPoint programs, which we did with our winter lecture series. These are all great opportunities for people to come in and enjoy, as well as learning in a safe and friendly and fun environment. If you don't have any visual aids, then limit your talk to about 20 to 30 minutes. People don't want to stand around that may lose interest just hearing a talking head after 20 up to 30 minutes. Remember to target your audience. Living history is something that I'm bringing here this year, and that is any various activity involving the recreation of living conditions of the past. So we may have a history's mysteries cart out back. And it could be an informal living history program, which showcases some of the items that would have been used by an example, a Civil War soldier. These don't have any start times to them, but if you notice that two people lead to six, and then all of a sudden 12 people, just say, hey folks, would you guys mind if I go ahead and take 10 minutes and explain everything as to what you see here? And I bet you nine times out of 10, all 12 people are going to want to stay in here, what you say. What's awesome about that is that you just turn an informal program to a formal one. You also have formal programs. These are living history programs that have a start time. So you want to make sure that you're there early, you start on time, and you end it on time. When you're doing these programs, have lots of tangible items with you. That way, if you're talking about, for example, Civil War rations and the haversack, make sure you have the haversack and all the rations out so people can see them. Um, one thing that I found, if you're allowed to do it, if you can start a small fire and just take a boiler with water and coffee. People love the smell of firewood and they love the smell of coffee boiling in the air. And that also kind of connects them through senses to the past. Don't forget about the civilian aspect of it. Civilians played a key role during the entire history of North America since the first settlers came here. But remember, research your location and research the social status of that area. That way all your clothing, your personal belongings, um, your, the lifestyle that you're trying to portray really reflects the town or the environment that you're in. So for an example, if you're here in Shippensburg during the mid 1800s, you're probably going to be along the lines of the middle and lower class. But don't forget about all the other historical resources that are out there. You can do PowerPoint programs on railroads that came through here, or bridges, or industry that was here. So don't be narrow-minded as far as, well, the Civil War and the French and Indian War are the only things that people care about here. Make sure that you try to incorporate as much of this into your programming as possible. Educational programs are a curriculum-based program that teaches youth and school groups certain aspects of history through tangible items. And we have a lot of educational programs here that are put together uh, for the Historical Society. And basically the programs are built off of this outline theme, which is your description of the program, the objective, which is the tools and techniques of how children of the group will learn, materials, these are the interpretive tools that will be used, procedures, how will the program be conducted, Topics to be highlighted. This is an overview of the theme. So if you're talking about Civil War, you might want to add in um, some of the Underground Railroad aspects to it as well. Main themes, if you're talking about the Civil War, if there's battles, soldiers, uniforms, etc. And the program should also list out 
how many students that you're allowing to participate, how long it's going to take, and what is the grade. So for Cannoneers Post, that I did for Antietam and South Mountain, I can only do up to eight students. It takes 30 minutes for me to go through the rotation on the cannon, and it's only good for grades five on up. It takes 45 minutes if I go ahead and give them this worksheet here for them to work on, because of the fact that this worksheet it teaches them math, science, as well as teamwork. And then you have the last aspect of it, which is a naturalist. Even though you think living in a town there's no natural history or natural resources, there are. You have animals, you have birds, a stream that's right back here behind the building. One of the things we're thinking about doing is taking our backyard and applying for a grant to get native species of plant life with interpretive markers. That way we can go ahead and continue on hitting what's called an open concept museum or open air museum. Um, Nature Nuts is a really good program that uh, gets children out as well as Scales and Tails which allows children to basically um, see up close different reptiles and stuff like that. These are all great programs. Well, I want to thank you folks for watching. I hope you had fun. I hope you learned quite a lot. But we were just basically touching the iceberg with this topic here today. It takes a lot more than um, what it seems to go into a program. But the one thing that's very rewarding about doing programs and lectures, because I've been all over as far as like in Pennsylvania down to North Carolina, you meet a lot of interesting people from all around the world. And that is absolutely an amazing feeling when you can talk to somebody from Russia or England, for an example, and they're here because of the program that you're putting on. There's no better feeling like it in the world. And even after years that I've given programs for the 150th down in South Mountain in Antietam, I still had people from Texas and California going to Gettysburg when I was there saying, John, I don't know if you remember me, but I sure remember you. And I enjoyed that program that you gave, and you brought a lot of life and perspective to the topic that you were presenting. So, folks, I know it's bad times out there, but I promise you, just like everybody else is saying, we're all going to get through this pandemic together. And when we come out of it, we're going to be better for it. If you're not keeping a diary of the events taking place every day, I would encourage you to do so because not too many diaries exist from the Spanish flu. At least with today, I know a lot of my colleagues, including myself, we are doing that. So take care of yourself, and we'll see you next time, and thank you for watching.